I do you guys a lot. I um this is I'm usually short. <laughs> this is nice. Um, so I just want to start by first saying I'm really sorry for the delay. If you guys wanted to get started a while ago, I apologize that uh, I'm just slow. And so thanks for your patience. I'm really, really grateful. Um, so a couple things happened. Um, must have been a month ago, right? We had Valentine's Day. So on Valentine's Day, my dad called me up and he says, hey, I'm coming to Duluth. Your mom has some stuff she wants to give you. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever, you're not, that sounds great. So he comes to the Newman Center where I live, and he says, I got these three things. And he has me, he hands me um, a coffee mug, which is awesome. It has like this happy Valentine's Day, hearts, you know, he wrote my name, the Father Mike on the side. I'm like, huh, adorable. Um, there was a bag, like a really big bag of her like special, uh, like two dozen chocolate chip cookies that she makes just, they're amazing. And it was like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, my mom doesn't like normally give me Valentine's Day presents. And I'm just like, this is so big, this is so great. I know exactly what to do with this coffee mug because, well, it's called the coffee mug. So I drink coffee, there you put the things together. The other thing is I know exactly what to do with the chocolate chip cookies. But then the third thing was, in the coffee mug was a sock monkey with like a heart on its chest. And I'm like, this. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think that. I was just like, I just, this is just, she gave me something to throw away. Because, I mean, I didn't get you're like, what? What a jerk. I'm like, I know, whatever, deal with it. Um, but, but that's why she gave me the, I'm like, I think, no, I know exactly what to do with, with the mug. It's very obvious. I know exactly, even more, I know even more exactly what to do with the, with the chocolate chips. I can eat them, I can share them. I have no idea what to do with a sock monkey. Like honestly, someone said, one of my students, because I actually did throw it in the trash, and I'm like, I feel bad, so I took it back out of the trash. Um, she said, well, just put it on the shelf. I'm like, and then what? <laughs> honestly, and then what do you do? Like, maybe someone would give you more sock monkeys. I'm like, then I have a collection. I'm that weird priest with the sock monkeys. <laughs> I'm into my home. Here are my sock monkeys. <laughs> Very strange. Why do you have these? I don't know. People keep giving them to me. What do you do with them? I don't know. And that's the thing. Sometimes, sometimes, one of the things we do pr pretty much a lot as like Christians, as, as prayers, probably when you go to pray, when I go to pray, we're really good at asking for stuff, right? I mean, pretty much, you when it comes to prayer, we go to, before the Lord, we know, okay, God, if you love us, then I can tell you what I want. But we're not very good at receiving stuff. Maybe you are, and I don't want to you know, put any things on you, but sometimes we struggle with like receiving stuff, receiving gifts well. We know how to ask for gifts, but sometimes we don't know how to receive gifts well. I mean, what would be a way that we could receive a gift well that we probably do? Well, one would be with the coffee mug with the chocolate chip cookies, is I know exactly what to do. So one of the ways we can receive a gift well is to use it. Right, so like when you get a gift, if you want to honor the person who gave you the gift, you use the gift. It would be really, really lame of me to know exactly what to do with a, with a coffee cup and a coffee mug and then just put it on the shelf and never ever use it. But if I want to honor my mom, I want to honor the giver of the gift, I know exactly what I need to do. I need to use this gift. But the question sometimes is this, like, I don't know if I have any gifts. I imagine sometimes I'll talk to, talk to people and they say, I don't know if I have any gifts. Well, they're thinking typically of, they're th typically thinking of, I don't know if I'm more gifted than the people in my school. I don't know if I'm more gifted than the people on my team or in my orchestra or in my band or wherever it is. But I don't know if I have any gifts. I would say, come over here so I can punch you in the face. <laughs> because um, there's these, all these, we're surrounded by these, you are all gifted. I mean, every single one of you. You're welcome. <laughs> you're, welcome. Um, you're all, you're all gifted. You're all gifted. I mean, does it, we have a bunch of even ordinary gifts. I mean, how, what's one ordinary gift? How about, um, I don't know, life? <laughs> like, none of us did anything to be alive. We didn't, anything to des we didn't do anything to deserve being alive. We didn't do anything to, like, to merit that you should live. Kind of. We just got to receive life as a gift. Imagine, this is the craziest thing to, to realize. I didn't have to exist. Like, you didn't have to exist. I mean, you ever stop to think about this, the, this reality that when it comes down to it, the only reason that you're alive, the only reason that you exist is because God wants you to exist. Well, sometimes, you know, I've talked about it at Mass this weekend, but you know, sometimes how, how people will start to doubt whether God loves them because they think that, uh, I love saying this down south, they think that God loves y'all. <laughs> God, here's news for you. God doesn't love y'all. God loves you. God loves you. 
God loves you. He loves people individually. He doesn't love you to eat people with like an atomic bomb. He loves them like a sniper. Right? Like, atomic bomb is like whatever, just throw it out there. Y'all get decimated. God loves it like a sniper. Like, I got you in my sights. Like, I'm aiming at you and pulling the trigger with his love bullets. But God loves you. He doesn't love y'all. He loves you. Indi- Sorry, the good thing I was in the front row. He loves you individually. He said, "Yeah, but it still feels like, well, God loves me because He has to love me." Have you ever thought that? God loves me because He has to love me. Okay, this means yes. This means no. I don't know. You ever thought God loves me because He has to love me? He loves everybody. Fine, whatever. It's no big deal. Yes, maybe He loves everybody, but you didn't have to exist. Which means. That out of all the people who could have existed, he wanted you to exist. And God wants, he still wants you to exist. Yeah, but I fail, I mess up, I do all these bad things. Yeah, but still God wants you, he still wants you to exist, or you wouldn't exist. Which means that God love, God's love for you is incredible. God's love for you is infinite. But here's the thing, it's not like infinite for y'all. He's God's love is infinite for you. You ever think about this? That God's love for you is completely 100% unique. Because God's infinite, you know, in himself. He actually can love each every, each and every individual in an infinitely unique way. The love God has for you is nothing like love he has for someone else. It is infinitely unique. Because he doesn't love y'all. Say, uh, Pope Benedict, he said this, he said, each one of us is a result, a direct result of the thought of God. Each one of us is a result of the direct thought of God. Like, God, you didn't exist at one point, and then God said, God said, God said, God said, um, let me think. God said, God thought, or he said, I want you to exist. And then you did. And the only reason why he wanted you to exist, because he wanted to have the chance to love you. The only reason why you exist is God wanted to have the chance to love you. And then he gave you this ordinary gift of life. He gave you ordinary, I mean, think about it. There are some people, maybe even in this room, I'm not sure, um, some people can't get out of bed on their own. But this morning, I imagine most of you got out of bed on your own. I imagine most of you walked here. That's a gift. Imagine that that, um, every single person here fed themselves today. Like not only do you have food, but you also have to feed yourself. You didn't have need someone else to feed you. Unless you're like one of those couples, you know. <laughs> that was pretty good acting, wasn't it? I thought that was stellar. But every single one of us has those ordinary gifts. So what's one of the ways that we can honor the giver? Use the gift. Think about this. I just have an idea. Think about this. From the moment you were born until now, every single day, you have been the sole beneficiary of 24 hours. Every day. Every day you've gotten 24 hours that were all yours. Every single day, from the day you were born until now, for nothing, you got them for free. You, got them, you didn't have to do it. Complete gift, ordinary gift. Every single day, from the two dozen gifts. Every single day, from the two dozen hours. Every single day, from the day you were born until right now. So again, question: How do we honor the giver of the gift? Well, we use the gifts. So I get these two dozen cookies. If I would eat them all myself, what would you call me? Fatty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, not to your face, Father. We say it behind your back. <laughs> no, honestly, if I ate all two dozen myself, I would be, I mean, a pig, right? I mean, that was, that's, a, that's a description. I would be a hog. I would be a hungry, hungry hippo. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, no, they're mine. They're all mine. I look at my two dozen cookies and I think, no, these are all mine. These are all my cookies. But here's the thing. I get two dozen hours every day. Sometimes we look at them like they're all mine. 
sometimes they don't get our two dozen hours. Like, no, they're all mine. They're mine to do what I want, what I want with. And yes, school takes some, and my parents take some, and maybe have a job and it takes some, but the rest of it all mine. But how are they used? Are they spent all on yourself? Do I share any of them? Do I give any away? Do I give any back to the giver? Do I share any? Do I spend any of my hours, my two dozen hours a day, on people, someone who might need it, someone who might need need to listen to them, someone who might need to need to talk to them, someone who might need actually need to help them, or are they just all mine? When it comes to my two dozen hours, I'm just a hungry, hungry, hungry hippo. <laughs> This recognition of like being able to say, so I need to use them. But here's the, the question we sometimes have is like, well, how do I use this? How do I use this gift? Sometimes we look at life and we think, okay, it's a sock monkey. I know exactly what to do with this gift. I know exactly what to do with that gift. But when it comes to this, I don't, I don't know what God wants. I don't know what he is calling me to do. Realizing that, yes, I'm here because God wants me here. I'm loved by God individually, infinitely, uniquely, uniquely, but I don't know what to do with my life. How do I take a step forward? Well, here's a little, little simple tools for you to be know how to take your step forward. How do you discern? How do you figure out what to do with the gifts that God's giving you? Say someone was interested in... Say here's a gentleman. We call him Jack. He was interested in a young lady. We'll call her Jill. And Jack is looking at Jill, and Jack says, to, thinks to himself, he thinks, okay, I noticed Jill. I, she, I noticed that she had this color hair, this color eyes. She's this tall. Okay, and she likes um, volleyball. I should marry her. <laughs> I mean, when you say that's wise, Jack, Jack is being wise. <laughs> well, it depends. I mean, how good is she at volleyball, right? <laughs> That's not really wise, right? That's what does Jack need in order to make a, be- a good decision about whether you should marry Jill or not? That personality. <laughs> what, no, honestly, like, what, if, what, if you were if you were Jack, if you were Jack's friend, Jack's like, I think I should marry that girl. You say, Hey, Jack, maybe you should get to know her. Oh, thank you. So you guys do. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, not like do no stuff. I meant like that was an insult. I meant like. <laughs> I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. <laughs> so, you say, Jack, no, maybe you need to get to know her. Maybe you need to get more information. Sometimes we find ourselves in front of like a, a, a decision and we're thinking, okay, I have this gift, I have this opportunity. I don't know what to do because I need more information. And the reality is, if Jack thinks, no, I have to decide right now if Jill's supposed to be my wife, and he thinks, I need to decide today or else I'll lose it forever. And he's thinking the wrong way, but so many times when it comes to making decisions, we think, no, I have to choose right now, one way or the other. As opposed to say, actually, right now, what I have to do is I have to just get more information. I have to get more data. He has to find out, what is Jill's last name? (laughs) He has to find out, like, what is she like? What is she like? Does she even know that he exists? I mean, this is, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. They're like, I think I'm going to marry her. She's like, she doesn't even realize you are alive. Like, you might be a thought in the mind of God, but not in the mind of Jill. Um, this recognition that, like, I need to get more information. I need to know her more. And so the same kind of thing has happened when it comes to any decision. If I'm facing it, for example, um, what kind of major, major should I choose? What kind of college should I go to? Say, I don't know. I, maybe I should go to Notre Dame. Maybe I should go to Baylor. Maybe I should go to Northern Texas. Maybe I should go wherever. I know I just named three schools. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about these schools. Maybe I should I go there? Maybe you have to do a campus visit. Anyone here made any campus visits this year? Yeah, so you get there, right? And you're like, do I like this school or do I not like this school? When you couldn't like, choose it wisely, unless you had more information. You needed more information. And so this recognition of when you're faced with a decision, when you're faced with discernment, God is not like this. Sometimes you think about this. When it comes to discernment, all we have to do is this. Okay, God, go ahead. Go. No, seriously, I'm praying. God, talk to me. What should I do? And we wait around. We think, like, like actually what God is going to do is he's just going to at some point be like, do that. <laughs> or, or we think this. We think, like, what if I choose? What if I make a decision? And it's the wrong decision. What if I make a decision? I go to um, Franciscan, and I was supposed to go to St. Thomas Aquinas College. My whole life is ruined. 
What if I go on a date with Jill? I'm supposed to go on a date with Jane. What if I end up becoming a priest and on my first day of being a priest, I look out into the congregation and there she is. <laughs> and God came out going like, oh man, we're so close. <laughs> Like, what if I make the wrong decision? This kind of thing sometimes we're afraid of this. We're afraid of making the wrong decision, making it pull the wrong trigger, going to the wrong school, picking the wrong major, picking the not the perfect job or not the perfect spouse or not the perfect vocation. You have to realize though that there's no such thing as the perfect spouse. And while God may have a plan for your life, ultimately, you actually are free to make mistakes. I don't know if we realize this sometimes, that you're actually free to make mistakes. Because think about, even the mystery of the cross is the worst thing that ever happened to humanity. The worst thing that ever happened in human history was that God became one of us, and when we got the chance, the first chance we got, we killed him. The worst thing that ever happened. That was not God's plan. He was able to take the worst thing that ever happened and bring the best thing that ever happened out of that. So here's the thing. God can take even your mistakes and he can make some really good things out of that. Even if I chose the wrong college, God can come to there and fix it. I married the wrong person. You always marry the wrong person. God can come in there and fix it. Yeah, I chose the wrong vocation. God can meet you in that place, and he can do incredible stuff with that. The reality, of course, is this. When we make discernment, we, we want to follow God's will, but sometimes... We just wait around and we think God's just going to tell us what it is. No, actually what we have to do is we have to take a step forward. We have to find out more information. We have to learn more. So what's a decision you're going to have to make soon? Maybe college, maybe major, maybe dating this person or not, maybe visiting a seminary or visiting a religious community and saying like, okay, that's, that's you know what all that is? All that is is just getting more information. All that is is becoming wise. All that is is knowing more so you can make a better Decision. Another piece of the second step. First step is get more information. The, the second second step is seek counsel. Is to seek counsel. It basically is to be able to say like, hey, who might be able to give me some good advice? So, um, back to Jack and Jill. Jack wanted to see if Jill was interested in. What would he do? Well, if he was really bold, he'd ask her. If he was me, he'd ask her friends. <laughs> or he'd ask his friends to ask her friends if she was interested in him. I mean, that's how things worked back in the 90s, you guys. Um, but the recognition of being able to say, he would seek counsel. He would ask someone who knows. Now, have you ever done this? Where you ask someone who has no idea. So, like, here's Jack. And he's got his, he's got his, he's got his buddy, John. And John, that, John doesn't know Jill either. But Jack asks John and says, Hey, John, what do you think Jill thinks of me? John's like, oh, she loves you. <laughs> Can you talk to her? Not a word. <laughs> so is John the right guy to be asking? Yeah. Absolutely not. I have all these at, at the university. It's so great. I work at the University of Minnesota up in Duluth, and, and I have these, these students who come to me, and they're like, okay, Father, you know, I'm majoring in physics. And what kind of job should I get? And I'm like, I got to tell you. I don't know anything about physics. I literally know nothing about jobs that employ physicists. Like, I have no idea. I mean, I, I, don't ask me. I can ask you, I mean, I can help with the other things, but when it comes to, hey, if my major is engineering, should I work for, you know, this company or that company? Well, I got this quarter. We're going to flip it. So who do they have to ask? You have to ask someone who's in the field. Someone actually knows more about what you need to know more about. So seeking counsel is so important, but seeking counsel from the right place. Um, it's one of, one of the dumbest things. In scripture, there's just one story. Um, in scripture, there's a story. There's this guy, his name's Rehoboam, and Re Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, you know, it's like, um, Jeroboam is the son of Solomon. And Solomon is one point. So Solomon's the son of David. Remember David the king? Solomon's the son of David the king, and he becomes the king. And then Solomon, he, he wants to build all this stuff in Jerusalem. He builds up Jerusalem. It's just amazing. It's incredible. People come from all over the known world to see Solomon's city of Jerusalem. Like this. And then along comes his son, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam has, is faced with a decision. Jeroboam is faced with a decision. The decision is, will you work people as hard as your dad? 
Or will you go easy on them and they take care of your people? So Jeroboam, he asks two different groups of people. One is he asks the people that he was raised with, basically his high school buddies. Like, hey, what do you think I should do with the people? And they're like, Jeroboam, you gotta come down on them hard. If they were afraid of Solomon, your dad, they gotta be twice as afraid of you. You gotta push them even harder. The old men of the city, the wise ones, he asked them, what should I do? And they said, just go easy on the people. Give the people a break. And the city, the country, the entire kingdom will stay united. <coughs> Jeroboam didn't listen to the people who knew what was going on. He didn't listen to the people who had good counsel. He listened to the people who didn't know any more than he did. And it, it literally tore the kingdom apart. That the kingdom of God actually fell into ruins. Because this guy sought counsel, but he sought counsel from the wrong source. So seek counsel from people who know what they're talking about. So first, first thing to do is get more. And then second step is to seek counsel. But the third thing is so important, you guys, you have to have courage. You gotta have courage. Because I can know what the right thing to do is and not do it. I always say this, I always think, um, it's always easy to do the right thing, as long as the right thing is easy to do. You ever have that experience where it's just like, no, it's easy to, right, easy to do the right thing when the right thing is easy to do. It's hard to do the right thing when the right thing is hard to do. So at church, like it's easy to do the right thing. Why? Because everyone's, you know, pretty much all, we're all trying to do the right thing. It's really hard to do the right thing when you are in the midst of a really difficult moment, a really difficult decision. It's even difficult to do the right thing when you know exactly what it is. You've taken you the information, you've taken counsel, but now it's time to take a step. Now it's time to make a decision. Now it's time to make a choice. And you have to act. You have to have courage. I would say this, I would say that if there's, yeah, not anything, but if there's anything that our culture lacks, if there's any kind of real crisis that we're going through, our culture is going through a real crisis of courage. Where we don't actually reward courage. We don't necessarily even think that it's something people need to have. Because it's like, oh, just do whatever you want. Do whatever you feel like. And the thing is, I rarely feel courageous when I need to be courageous. You ever have that experience? I rarely feel courageous when I need to be courageous. And so most, most of our culture is saying, do whatever you feel, do whatever you want. Well, when I, when I need to be bold, when I need to actually be heroic, is when I least feel like being old. It's when I least feel like being heroic. Some of you know what I'm talking about when it comes to, um, it's easy to tell the truth when the truth doesn't cost you anything. It's really difficult to tell the truth when you're gonna lose something. It's easy to be honest on a test with your homework or at a job when being honest doesn't cost you anything. But it's very, very difficult to not cheat when you realize, if I don't cheat on this test, I will get the grade that I deserve. That's the grade you deserve. And it takes courage to do the right thing at that moment, even though, no, I have all the information I need. I know exactly what the right thing to do is. I don't need to take any counsel because I know it's wrong to cheat. In this moment, it's very hard to do the right thing, and that's the moment when I need courage. This recognition of being able to step, step back and say, I can keep gathering information, and I can keep taking counsel, but at some point, I've got to pull the trigger. Again, yeah, I'm afraid of missing. But anyone here a hunter? Any hunters here? Okay, I'm not in Minnesota. <laughs> but a couple guys, a couple people here. Um, so in Minnesota, every every year we have we got a ton of deer up north of Minnesota, and so we have a lot of deer hunters up in north northern Minnesota. And I know at this moment there's some people here going, "What? <laughs> oh, we kill them? <laughs> yes, and they're delicious." <laughs> There it is. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. Oh, um, so, well, here's what you have to do. Before the hunting season starts, what you have to do is you have to go sight in your rifle. Has anyone ever sighted in a rifle? There's one thing you do. When you sight in a rifle, it's like you line up the, the target in the scope or whatever, and you basically get the crosshairs right there on the target. And what would happen if you got the crosshairs right there on the target and said, get it, sight it in, and then walk away? 
What you have to do is what? You have to line it up, sight it in, and then you have to pull the trigger. You have to see, am I on? Am I off? Am I to the left? Am I to the right? Am I higher? Am I low? Yeah, yeah, in order to know where you are, you have to actually make a decision. You have to actually pull the trigger in order to know if you're going in the right direction. And then what you do is pull the trigger. Okay, I'm, I'm to the right. Now I make adjustments. Line it up and try again. We're so, I don't know about you, but so often we can be so afraid of failing. We can so, be so afraid of missing that we're, we're too afraid to act. That's why we need courage. And that's why we need to know that before all of this stuff is that you're directly a result of the thought of God, that he loves you. So even if you miss the target, line it up, try it again. Miss it again. Okay, line it up, try it again. Miss it again. Doesn't matter. Line it up, try it again. Because why? Because the person who lines it up and tries it again is the courageous person. And I got to tell you this. There is no saint who ever existed that did not have guts. There's no saint that ever existed that did not have courage to get it wrong, did not have courage to fail, did not have courage to say, you know what, I got the information, I got my counsel, now I just gotta go. Some of you right now are at the point where you have all you need to know. You have all the data that you need to make that next step. You've taken all the right counsel, you need to take the next step. All you need, tonight, all you need is just courage. You just need to try. So where is it in your life tonight that you say, I just need to try. I just need to use it. I've gotten these gifts, this gift of life, this gift of being loved, this gift of faith. You might even have, again, as I said, extraordinary gifts. You know exactly what to do. Or you know maybe kind of close to what to do. And all you, the next thing you need to do is you need to have courage. I imagine some people tonight, I talk to a lot of high schoolers and a lot of college students where they're in a relationship that they just know is not good for them. They know it. I mean, it's, it's really clear to them. But they're so afraid of walking away from it because they're so afraid of what could happen if I don't have this person anymore that they're just they're going to stay miserable until it just dies and part of them dies. I say be courageous. If that's you, don't be afraid. Take that step. Um, two things. Last two things. When it comes to discernment, like when it comes to your vocation, a lot of times that can freak us out like nothing else. Like if you want to be a saint, I'm talking about that on, on Wednesday. If you want to be a saint, you know the whole point of your life is to be a saint. And to get to the end of your life and not have become a saint is the only tragedy in the world. Like it's possible to fail at life, right? Is to get to the end of life and not be a saint, that's failure. Sorry, maybe you didn't know that. You didn't. You know that. You knew that. You knew that. Um, get to the end of your life. And I'm not talking about capital S T period saints, like you know, someone declared you a saint, like that's failure. No one no one called me a saint. <laughs> I'm talking about like becoming the man or woman God wants you to be. That's the goal. That's the dream, right? Um, that's what success is. Failure is not to become a man or God wants you to be. So sometimes we want to know what we need to know our vocation. Sometimes we, in the process of that, we don't pay attention to any of the other gifts. Here's what I mean. I'm generalizing about something very personal to me. When I was in high school, I had this encounter with the Lord about 15 years old. It was a, it was a powerful thing where I, I was raised Catholic and what happened was I never wanted to go to Mass. I never wanted to go to church. I would always like, I would pretend to be sick so I could get out of going to Mass, which is the dumbest thing in the world in my family because if you were too sick to go to Mass, then you were too sick to do anything the rest of the day. And so, I, yes, I got out of one hour of Mass, but then I had to stay in my room the entire rest of the day and the rest of the night. And it was like, well, you're too sick to go to church. And I'm like, that's great. That's a great deal. I'm an idiot. Like, that's not a great deal. But anyways, I'm 15 years old, and I had this encounter. Like, I have this realization that actually, no, I, I have sinned. And like, I, I can't just forgive myself. I need someone else to forgive me. I need the Savior. It was this moment of realization of like, oh my gosh, I need Jesus. And so I remember I was like, I need to go to confession. I'm 15 years old, so I got on my bike at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning and rode over to the priest's house, you know, and knocked on the door and like, you know, and uh, the priest answered the door because, you know, priests, he was there clearly at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning because priests only were a couple hours a weekend. And, um, <laughs> And he answers the door, I'm like, oh, hey, can I go to confession? He's like, sure, come on. So I went to confession, sat down on the couch, went to confession, and I walked out of that house. And I remember thinking, like, this is incredible. 
I'm stepping off this front porch going, oh my gosh, this is, all my sins are gone. Like they're all, I'm completely forgiven. This is, a, this is amazing. And I remember thinking, like I stepped off this front porch, like my life is different from now on. Like it's, it has to be different from now on. And my first thought was this, was as I stepped off that porch, I was God, if you ever want me to be a priest, I will hear anyone's confession anytime they want. My second thought was, well, she's really cute. <laughs> but still, the first thought was like, oh my gosh, God, if you want me, I'll, I'll be a priest. And so then, that, that like, set my life on this course of like, God, you want me to be a priest, you want me to be a priest, you want me to be a priest. And I was just like, every time I went to prayer, every time I went to mass, every time I went to a retreat or anything, the question was this, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to be a priest? And that was the only thing I wanted. Every time I went to prayer, every time I went to Mass, every, every retreat I went on. And so every Mass, every retreat, every time of prayer, I felt like it was a failure. Because I wanted what I wanted. I wanted the answer to this question. Meanwhile, God gave me all these gifts, all these gifts, all these gifts. And I'm like, I don't want those. I want those. I want that. Like, I want, God, I just want you to tell me what you want me to do. And all this time, he's giving me these gifts, and I'm completely ignoring them. And completely wasting them. Because I want what I want. <coughs> Sometimes there's these hidden, hidden gifts that God's trying to give you, but we say, no, no, but I want this one. God's trying to even just give me some peace, give me some rest. But we're like, no, no, no. God, I want to get into that school. God, I want her to notice me. I want him to notice me. Meanwhile, God's just saying, just, why don't you be able to come into my presence and just enjoy this time of prayer? Like tonight. We're going to, after this, we're going to go into adoration. And uh, there's this recognition that well, sometimes we go before the Lord and we just, again, we just ask, God, I want this. God, I want this. God, I want this. As opposed to saying, God, what do you want to give me? Can you help me, like, just help me receive these gifts? Because he's going to give you the information you need. God loves you a lot. So he's going to give you the info, the data that you need. He's going to provide people where you can take counsel. And if you ask for it, when it's time to pull the trigger, he's going to give you the courage that you need to be that hero, to be that saint. He's going to give it when you need it. He's not going to be a moment too late. He's also not going to be a moment too early. We just need to do those three things. We need to get more information, take counsel, and be courageous. This is the last thing. What happens, though, when that gift is a sock monkey? <laughs> it's not a mug. It's definitely not cookies. It's a sock monkey. And you say, what am I going to do with this? What's, what, you know, if, if one way you can honor the giver is to use the gift, one way you can honor the giver of your life is to use your life. Honor the giver of your hours in the day is to use those days to make a decision with wisdom. Again, getting data, information, taking counsel, being courageous. What if you have no idea? I have no, I have no idea what to do with this. One, what, one thing to do? Just say thank you. Imagine there's a lot of gifts you've received in the course of your life, maybe in the course of this last week, and no idea what to do with it. I had no idea the discernment of like, God, what do you want me to do with this gift? But also, all we did was like this. <laughs> Thanks. Garbage. You know how bad we are at saying thank you? I mean, maybe you get people who are really bad at saying thank you. Or you try to give them a compliment, and they always make an excuse. Like, saying, that's a really nice shirt. Oh, I only got it for $4. <laughs> like, I really like your haircut. Yeah, they messed it up in the back. <laughs> okay, well... Yeah, it's dumb. And you're dumb. Like, I, like, what do you want me to say? How about, how about, like, hey, I really like that. Thank you. You know, we try to make excuses and deflect. One of the best ways you can honor someone who gives you a gift is to just receive the gift with grace. To receive the gift graciously. To be able, when someone gives you a compliment, to look them back in the eye and say, thank you. I was talking to a guy and his girlfriend, he was saying his girlfriend was, he's like, I told him, I feel so bad because like, I'll come home from work and she would come to my apartment and she like, had made me suffer. Like she got done with her school, got done with her work and she just came over to my place, made me suffer. So when I got home from this long day, they were suffering. I felt so bad. I don't know what to do. I'm like, 
say thank you. <laughs> because if she's going to go to all that trouble of giving you this gift, the least you can do is honor her by saying, you just gave me a gift. Thank you. Again, tonight we're going to go into adoration. And maybe there's a lot of gifts in your life that you don't have any idea what to do with. You have no idea. What am I supposed to do with this? Maybe tonight is a new kind of night. A new kind of night where you get to see the Lord in the Eucharist. And you look back at Him. And it's not about, God, give me more. Give me more. Give me more. It's just looking at God and saying, Jesus, thank you. I don't know what to do with this, but all I know is that you gave me this gift. Thank you. I don't know what you want me to do with my life for the next 24 hours. I don't know what you want. So thank you. To graciously receive a gift is to honor the giver of the gift. And if tonight you make that decision, to simply graciously receive the ordinary gifts of your life. Make the decision tonight to graciously receive the extraordinary gifts in your life. To make the decision tonight to receive a gift that you have no idea what to do with. To look back at the Lord Jesus and say, Jesus, thank you. That honors the giver of the gift. And say her. Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify you and we thank you. Thank you for all the good gifts that you, that you give to us. Help us to know when to seek more information. Help us to know when we need to seek good counsel, people we can rely upon. And Jesus, give us the courage that we need to do the right thing when the right thing is hard to do. Give us the courage to take that next step. Give us the courage to pull the trigger. And please, Jesus, we ask that you please help us to say thank you. Help us to be gracious receivers of your many gifts your ordinary and extraordinary gifts. Help us, Jesus, tonight, in front of your presence, to be able to look back at you, to know that we are loved by you, and to simply say thank you. Tonight, we say this. I invite you right now, just silently, or if you want to even say it out loud, just quietly, just, just thank you, Jesus. And even like, hold it in your head or hold it in your heart, like something you actually have, a real gift you received today. Just thank you, Jesus. Thank you for these ordinary gifts. Thank you that I can walk. Thank you for Starbucks. Uh, Jesus, thank you for bringing me to Texas. Jesus, thank you. My parents. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.